Well, always wonderful to see those children. They're the future of our church. And uh, it's just neat to see um, so many of them coming out and learning about Jesus. And uh, bless you guys that are, uh, that are helping with them. And, you know, it is, you know, I do, do want to make another appeal. Like, if, if you guys have some time that you can invest in that ministry there once in a little while, you don't have to do it every week, but once in a while, um, it is a real blessing. Um, you're, you have the potential to impact the child for eternity. And, uh, I, you know, I, I remember when I was a little boy, um, many of you don't know where I was raised or where I came from, but my dad worked for BC Hydro and we traveled to a number of different communities. And one of the communities I grew up in as a little boy was the small little town of Clinton down the road here. So I, I lived there for a few years with my parents when I was uh, an elementary school child. And um, there's, a, there's a man that had a, an impact on my spiritual development. And he, he wasn't, he kind, he wasn't um, a real good speaker or a real, you know, he wouldn't stand out in a crowd, let's say, if he was to get up and, and talk or whatever. But that man... That man walked with God. And we had a little class of about three of us, three or four of us. And he taught us week in and week out in Sunday school, and taught us about Jesus, taught us about the Bible and everything that it meant to him, you know. And, and relationally, he prayed with us. And I'll never forget that man. He's passed away now. Um, but that man was just an ordinary guy like you and me just an ordinary guy that served the Lord in that capacity. And I don't know if I would be standing here today if it weren't for people like him. Like, of course, we are, we're multifaceted people. We've got all kinds of things in our lives that, uh, that, are, uh, that are part of who we are, that make us who we are today. But that, that was beautiful. That, that man walked with Jesus and displayed the love of God to me. So I just want to say it if you can, can possibly think about it from those terms. You might think, I don't know what to say to kids. Ah, they're so energetic or whatever. I mean, yes, but, but that lasting impact can make a difference in the future of the church. God's people, we all work together. Amen. So when Jeremy calls for, uh, for extra help out there, because we need it. We need a couple extra people just to say, yeah, we'll be part of it, even if it's just once in a while. Anyway, I digress. Back to where we're going um, this morning. Um, we've uh, started a new series in the book of First Thessalonians. And um, this morning, we're going to continue where we left off. And um, last week, I spoke, about first, uh, spoke on First Thessalonians chapter one, and today we're going to go into First uh, Thessalonians chapter two, and we're going to be talking this morning about an example of godly leadership, and that's kind of the theme of this message this morning. So, even though it's directly related to leadership, it applies to everybody because Paul said, after all, he said, "Follow me as I follow Christ." So as we learn from examples set in Scripture from the leaders that God put, put there, we can all glean from this. So let's bow in prayer before we start into the Word this morning. Um, Jesus, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that you love each person here dearly. And God, we pray that your Holy Spirit, God, would, would just minister to the need and minister to the hearts of the people through what we discuss in the Bible today. Thank you, God, that we live in this country where we can preach the word freely. And we pray that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul, we took a look at their journey here, beginning into an age or an area called Macedonia. Now Paul, along with his companions, Silas and Timothy, 
they had crossed over the Aegean Sea into um, the region of Macedonia from the port of Troas. And last week I explained that's, if you've heard stories about Troy, ancient Troy, that's right where that is. Okay? And last week we learned how Paul originally had planned on traveling through Asia Minor until God gave him a dream. And he was beckoned to go to Macedonia. So the first place that Paul and his companions came to was the city of Philippi. Now, for those of you who are interested in Bible study, we're actually going through this, the, the study of the book of Philippians in our, in our Thursday afternoon Bible study. You're welcome to join us if you want. We dig into the Word and, and go deep in it. Um, but the first place Paul and his companions came to was the city of Philippi. And as they began to preach the gospel to the people, God blessed this ministry. They, he blessed the ministry and people started to accept the message that he was, he was presenting. However, there was a time in Philippi as they had begun to establish the church there. While Paul was preaching, um, they encountered a demon-possessed slave girl who was being used as a fortune teller, actually, by her masters. And she was earning her masters a great deal of money, and she continually interrupted Paul in the middle of his preaching. And he, she was saying things like, these men are sent from God, but it was interrupting them. And Paul recognized that this girl was possessed by a demon, so he commanded the demon to come out in the name of Jesus, and the demon left this girl. And when this demon left this poor little girl who was suffering under its oppression, um, she lost all her psychic abilities, or I guess you could, fortune-telling ability. She lost all of that. And because she was a slave, and she was being used to make money, the people that had her as their slave became furious with Paul, Silas, and Timothy and the, their group for doing this because they had interrupted their revenue stream. They weren't going to make the money that they made once before. So they were so furious and so angry that this girl could no longer make them money that they seized Paul and, and Silas and they dragged them uh, before the magistrates of the city and Paul and Silas were, uh, were actually beaten with rods. They were beaten with rods and they were thrown in the dungeon in stocks and chains and locked away. And we see, I'm not going to spe be preaching on this particular topic. I'm just using this as a backdrop. Okay. A miraculous thing happened. The, the Lord shook the earth and the chains fell off and the doors flew open and Paul and Silas didn't flee like most of us would if that would happen. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm out of here, right? We talked about this last week in our, in our Bible study, but they stayed because there was a jailer that was there that needed to hear the gospel. And not only did they stay, but the men that were in prison with them that could have run away, they stayed too. And this jailer and his whole family became believers because of this event, this miraculous event that God did. So, Needless to say, after they were released from prison, the magistrates uh, asked them, please, leave our, leave our city. So they, they left the city of Philippi, and they started down the road, and they came to another couple of other little communities along the way until they reached the city of Thessalonica. So that's the setting and the context for the letter that we're going to be diving into. So we begin in chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says this. He says, to the, to the Thessalonians, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously at Philippi, as you know. But with the help of God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. So after Paul and his entourage departed from Philippi, 
they came to Thessalonica, where Paul and Silas entered the Jewish synagogue when they came into town. They entered the Jewish synagogue and shared the gospel with all of the people that were there listening. And we're told that many people became believers as a result of this. However, there was not a uniform acceptance of the message. There were some people in the synagogue that um, did not believe. They chose not to believe. And furthermore, they were jealous, extremely jealous of Paul and his ministry team and the success that they were having in seeing people come. They, 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 they had this success and these people were jealous. So they stirred up trouble in Philippi and we see in the end what happened was Paul and his companions were only in Philippi establishing the church for a little while when this rioting began from these people that were stirring up trouble. They are saying, Paul and his companions are causing trouble all over the world and now they're here to stir up trouble and they started a riot. And the, the Christians that had come to know Christ in Philippi at the time said to Paul and Silas and, and Timothy, like, you guys, you guys need to go. Like, this is getting pretty intense here, so you need to leave. And they did. So, that was Paul's introduction to Thess Thessalonica. That was his, his introduction. He was only there for a short time with his ministry team, and they left, and uh, the church was left to, uh, to stand by itself. So Paul, later on, he's writing this letter because Paul was thinking about these guys. He, he loved them. Like, Christ had called him to preach there, and good things had happened, and he loved them. And he was concerned about them, so he sent Timothy to go back and see how they were doing. And then Timothy came back with a report and said, these guys in Thessalonica are doing awesome. Even though they're suffering much in the same way that they had been suffering, they're doing excellent. So this is Paul. So Paul is, uh, is talking about this, but... Now, because of all the ruckus that was caused and Paul having to leave town and everything, um, there, there might have been a group of people that were sort of questioning, like, what is Paul's motives? Are they pure? Um, was Paul doing what he was doing because maybe he had come to their city to, to mine their pockets? Maybe that's what his motivation was. Was this a great business venture? Um, was he a deceiver trying to trick them out of their hard-earned savings? You see, to understand why Paul opens his letter, uh, his, his introduction into chapter 2 this way, you have to understand what was going on in the city of Thessalonica at the time. Now, now the city of Thessalonica, like other cities in that era in that age there's certain places that had more i guess you could say religious cultism and and all that than others and and, and thessalonica was a very very religious place um, it wasn't like today where there's a lot of agnostic people most everybody was following some form of a religion uh, it was a virtual virtual smorgasbord of different religious cults and movements and a staggering variety of professionals were working in that city, vying for the loyalties and the financial support of the people. So among the places of worship you would find in Thessalonica, you'd find uh, temples um, dedicated to the worship of the Olympi uh, Olympian pantheon, the Greek pantheon, multiple gods, certain ones were more prominent than others in, in Thessalonica. But there was this movement of Greek gods and worship of Greek gods. And then there was um, mystery religions, the Greek mystery religions. And, and there was Roman state cults because they are controlled by Rome. State cults that define the political heroes of Rome. And, and you know, certain Caesars were called gods. And they all this stuff was going on. And, and on top of that, you had a Jewish community uh, with, with Jews following the traditional uh, law of Moses and, and, and that sort of uh, 
movement. And um, you also had Gentiles that were proselytes or, or God-fearing Gentiles that followed the Jewish faith. So you had this melting pot of all these religious people. And um, history tells us, and if you look in the history books, that most of these religions were missionary-minded religions too. And what I mean by that is they often sought to spread their faith using itinerant evangelists and, and, and preachers of their doctrines. And most of these religious recruiters were opportunists who took everything they could from their listeners and then moved on to find someone else to support them, making money and receiving personal glory from their well-acted performances were the primary motivations for many of these charlatan swindlers. And they were. They were. This was the environment. That's why Paul addresses the Thessalonians in this way. Because here in his lesser letter to the Thessalonians, Paul wanted to assure them that his gospel appeal had not been made on the basis of error, of some error. He didn't have impure motives, and he was not trying to trick them with some sleight of hand. Paul and his companions, unlike these other unrighteous religious solicitors that were about, they, uh, they were ministering in Thessalonica because they had found genuine truth. They had found freedom in Jesus Christ, if you remember Paul's uh, miraculous conversion on the road to Damascus. Jesus revealed himself directly to Paul. These guys were taking the message there because they wanted others to experience the same freedom and to have their blinded eyes open just like Paul's blinded eyes were opened by the power of the Lord. And they had a genuine call from God to take the message of the gospel to them. And that's why he continues saying in, this, in, in verse 4, he says, on the contrary, like we weren't trying to trick you, but on the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know that we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, nor from you, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. So Paul affirms to the Thessalonian believers that he's not trying to gain something. He wasn't there to try and gain something for himself by establishing a church in the city. He shared the gospel out of pure motivation. He shared so that people could be saved. Because without Jesus, everybody is lost. There is no name under heaven that has been given by which mankind can be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul was a, a herald of this. He was the, the groundbreaker. So he's telling the Thessalonians that this is where my heart is. You know, he, in the book of Acts, chapter 20, 21, 20 and 21, I always say, 2020, this is clarity. 20, Acts 2020. 20, Acts 2020. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, would, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. His message was simple. People were lost. See, if we come from a point where we see Christianity as just a good addition to our lives that makes us a better person, just because we follow some good, you know, good quality morality that the Bible addresses, and that's kind of where our fountain comes from, that's where we draw our, our Christian understanding from, that it's just a good set of principles. We're lost. It's only the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from sin. See, God doesn't accept you because of the good things you do. He accepts you because He died instead of you. And if you place your trust in Him, His sacrifice covers 
takes away, I shouldn't say covers, it takes away your sin and casts it as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. The grace of God and the love of God was lavished upon you. It was lavished upon you. And if you accept His invitation that He freely offers, you will be saved. And this is not something you earn. It's not something... The, the message that Paul was preaching here was that you must turn to God in repentance. If you see that Jesus is who He says He is and He says that He is the great I Am, God in the flesh, the sacrifice that paid for your sin, that if you trust in Him, you will be saved? If, if, that's, if that's what you, you come to, then then it doesn't matter what bad things you've done in your life. God can take that and cleanse you and wash you clean. And, and that's the gospel. You come to Him as broken. And you come to Him and saying, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know how to change. So many people don't come to church because they say, I'm not good enough to come to church. I can't change myself enough so that I can fit in there. I, I'm, I, I just, I have these things and, and I can't. I No, I, I can't or I don't want to change the things that are hanging on me. So, and sometimes, you know, in churches, we've, we've kind of almost encouraged this culture of, of people. You must be good, upstanding citizens before you can come to church. If you're a church-going person, you must be good. So you come as a good person. You, you dress up on your Sunday best and you, and you put on the best front of who you are because you're really a good person. No. That, that, that is false. It's misleading. I am a wretch. I am destined for destruction and the wrath of God is upon me unless I am saved. And if I don't have salvation, I am lost. And I'm destined to be separated from my God eternally. Have mercy on me, O oh God. I don't want to live the way I lived before. I want you. I need you. I can't make it without you. I don't come to you, Lord, because I'm righteous, but because I am a sinner in need of salvation. I need you. Oh, it sounds like familiar like the story, eh? The Pharisee guy. I thank my God that I'm not like the rest of those heathens out there. Therefore, he accepts me. Instead, of, the other guy was like beating his breast. I'm a sinner. God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. That penitent heart that comes with no pretense of pride. That's what we need to be before God. We're not saved because we're good. We're saved because He is good. Amen. So, Paul affirms that they had honestly come, that they weren't trying to do what they were doing out of greed. They weren't after the money. That's not, that wasn't their point. That's not what they were there for. I think ministries can be measured by how they handle the resources that are entrusted to them by their supporters. I really believe that. And the same story is true today. See, there's, there's preachers and itinerant evangelists out there masking their intentions to garner support from the people so that they can mine their pockets and they can live lavish lifestyles for themselves. Yeah, sure, a certain percentage of what they make goes to further their ministry. But really, it's all about them. It's all about them and their power and their comfort. Beware, people. Beware. They're out there today as much as they were back in the days of Thessalonica. Ministries with false pretense, giving a false 
image, you know. I, I, I knew, I've known people, you know, who give their life savings away to some guy. And uh, so that instead of, instead of, instead of growing the church in, in the third world, he adds another, another Rolls Royce to his collection of cars and says, thank you for giving to the Lord. God wants you to be healthy, wealthy. And, and, uh, and, f- and meanwhile, there's a poor widow somewhere who's given her life savings on the promise that God would bless her when she's giving this to, this, to the charlatan. God have mercy. This, this Americanized Christianity is hogwash. Christ didn't have a, have a pillow to lay his head on. Why? I'm not saying that we're all going to live in abstract poverty. That's not what I'm saying. Okay? God may choose to have you live in that state. But what I'm saying is, Dr. Ironside said this. He said, we recognize that ministers of Christ have to live and the Bible says that they preach the gospel and they should make their living from the gospel, but when ministers preach Christ simply as a means of making a livelihood, they've missed the path altogether. The Lord will support those who faithfully carry on His word and His work. But if they make personal gain their object for their ministry, it becomes obnoxious to God. It becomes obnoxious to Him. I'm not saying you guys need to weigh this out. And be careful. Be very careful with where you invest the resources God has given you and the ministries that you're investing in. Be very careful. The Apostle Paul lived as a minister who was approved by God. And he said, You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. Can the same thing be said of our ministry leaders and our ministries that we support here, that you support, that I support, that we are? Can we say the same thing as Paul? I pray that we can. And I pray, and I talk about this with others, that HCC will be faithful. Hillside Community Church will be faithful in giving and sending. God desires that we be a giving and ascending assembly. If He desires to increase our footprint here, it's not to align our pockets and to build this great big thing for ourselves. That's not where it's at. If God blesses us with abundant provisions, it's so that we can be a giving and ascending church, so that we can put more missionaries out on the field, so that we can support the ones that are out there in the places that we can't go, so that our ministries here will flourish, so that we will make an imprint on the caribou, and that it will make ripples throughout the Canadian uh, culture and beyond. That's what God wants. And that's what I want. I pray. But you know something? We've got to guard our hearts and watch our lives very carefully. Because if we're not careful, we can get we can get sidelined. I've seen churches start out really well. You have too. Start out really well. And all of a sudden they end up way out in left field. How did that happen? Because they did not watch their life and doctrine carefully. Guard your heart above all else. The scriptures say it is a wellspring. Guard your heart, your intentions. What do we do? Why do we do it? It's for the glory of God. You and I have breath in our bodies so that we can glorify Him with what we have and what we do. Our hands, our mouth, our resources. It all belongs to God and has is, is been given to us on loan. It's all His. Nothing that I have belongs to me. This church is not my church. This church is not your church. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. And we are part of it because He has saved us by the shedding of His blood. And He's called us to Himself to participate with Him in His good work. And His good work is to see the gospel go to the ends of the earth so that all men might see that Jesus Christ is God. Whether they accept him or not, I mean, most of them won't. 
But God wants us to be his ambassadors and making an appeal as though God himself was making an appeal through us, and he is. Oh, anyway. So Paul, Paul his, his, um, he's suggesting to these Thessalonians that, that a true gospel-centered ministry that he was bringing is never centered around self-interest for the sake of gaining power over people or financial gain. They are maximizing what God had given them for the sake of the gospel. And he's basically what he's doing by saying this is like the true saints of Christ are not like those charlatans of those other religions in Thessalonica who are trying to mine you, who are manipulating you for their own gain. We treated you the way that Christ wanted us to treat you. And how does he say, how did, they, how did Paul and his group of, of, of ministers that were with him treat these believers in Thessalonica? He says, continuing in verse 7, he says, instead, they weren't greedy, instead we are like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well. So we suggest to the Thessalonians that he and his team, they approached, they approached the Thessalonian church, the people, like a little child. See, what he's trying to say here is, they weren't masking some ulterior motive for coming to them. Young children, you know, the, the little ones, they present themselves just as they are, right? When they're hungry, you know it. <laughs> you know, they're, they're very true to what they're at right there. There's no masks. There's no false pretenses. They learn that af- as time goes on, but that's not how they are. So Paul is saying, I'm coming to you without these false pretenses. I'm coming to you without any ulterior motives. I just want you to go to heaven. I want you to know the God of the universe who saves people and sets them free by the power of his his resurrection. That's what he wanted. He wanted to know. He wanted people to know this. He then continues with this other family example saying that he and Silas and Timothy, you notice how he doesn't just say me. He says we. We. So if you look in the scripture, just as nursing cares, a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. There's no I there. Paul was talking about the people that God had placed with him on a team. We don't work as islands unto ourselves, people. We don't. We work together. You are the church and you are part of the body of Christ. And every one of you is part of it. We work together. And, and in this case... All of them, okay? They treated this, this new church in the same way that a mother cares for her newborn children. And there's probably no clearer picture of how Paul and his companions had the strongest affection for these believers in Thessalonica than this one. A good nursing mother does everything for the benefit of her children. Now, I don't totally get this because I was never... Like I was watching from the outside, but I never actually had that. So there's only part, I can only partly get get this, but I've seen it with my wife, how she nurtured our children. And you've seen it too, maybe, guys. And ladies, you know what it's all about. You know what it's like, you know. A good good nursing mother does everything for the benefit of the growth and and the protection of her children. She shelters and comforts and changes them when they make a mess and, and, and feeds them rich milk so that they grow strong and they grow. Nursing children are helpless. They need their mother's protection and she lovingly and unselfishly provides that. And Paul expresses that they had approached the new believers with the love and care of a mother with her Newborn children. No self-centered expectations. Sacrificial giving and love. 
newborns are helpless. They don't know how to do anything except be there, you know, and 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 they're and, and cry when they're when they're hungry and you know all that. No self-centered expectations. Sadly, so when 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 you see that example that's laid down by Paul and his ministry team, they treated this church with gentleness and nurturing. They came with no false pretenses and they came to care for them and to help them get started and to help them to grow. They, they came with that heart and sadly I must say that there's Christian leaders out there who don't follow this example of gentleness when it comes to dealing with God's people. Their approach to teaching people how to live the Christian life tends to be more based out of anger and pride and is confrontational and acrid. And people follow these leaders because their anger is disguised and they're fooled into thinking that their assertive approach is an indication of spiritual strength when nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus said in Matthew 5, chapter, chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Poor in spirit means admitting that we are broke and we're bankrupt apart from Jesus Christ and his, and his rescue. Our culture rejects this truth. Our culture teaches that you're blessed if you assert yourself, are proud of yourself, defend yourself, avenge yourself, serve yourself, promote yourself. That's what the world says. And that is what God says that we need to flee from. Being poor in spirit means living humbly before God and other people, treating others as better than ourselves. That's the example uh, that leaders are to set for the church because all of us are to follow that because that was the way of Jesus. And what is even sadder is that some of these brash, harsh, and arrogant leaders are making disciples after their own image, leading followers to believe that they should be embracing the same harmful attitudes as they are. And measure, measure of spiritual maturity is viewed as having the ability to successfully intellectually joust with an opponent, presenting a compelling argument that topples the other one. And the truth in the end with this kind of approach is that nobody gets changed. Christ is not glorified and the church witness is tarnished with the outsiders. What does it say? That they're going to know that we are his... We're going to know that, that we're, they're going to know that we are His by the love that we have one for another. Oh, how easily led astray we are in our, in our flesh. A harsh, cunning, and sharp spirit will never, I, I mark, never be aligned with the heart of God. Paul said it in a different way to the leaders of the Philippians. But I had the same idea in mind when he said in Philippians 4, 5, what did he say? Let your gentleness be evident to all. For the Lord is near. The Lord is near. And concerning avoiding contention, Paul also taught Timothy the way of Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy 2, 23 and 24, when he said, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant, get this, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind, not to just select people, must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. And it would be good for us as those who are maturing in Christ particularly those of us who have been granted leadership positions in the church, to learn from the example of Jesus and the Apostle Paul. Mature 
Believers ought to be gentle and nurturing towards others, particularly those who are new to the faith. They need to be cared for. They need to be protected. They need to be fed. They need to be nurtured. Good leaders sacrifice their own comforts and selfish interests for the benefit of those entrusted to them by God. Selfishness and Christ-honoring discipleship, friends, cannot go hand in hand. The two are incompatible with one another. The love of God is powerful and persuasive, and it is different than the way of this world. A gentle, understanding approach with people, particularly with new believers, is way, way more effective than severe, harsh approach. Is there a time for disciplinary action and, and being blunt and telling the truth bluntly? Yes, there is. I'm not saying we should never be firm and that there should never be discipline in the church. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is what characterizes everything we do, even in the times where discipline needs to take place, is done out of love for concern for that person so that they can be restored if they're broken. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of the apostle here. The love of God is powerful. Surely remember, and he says this in verse 9, surely remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. We are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. So, Paul's like, Folks, we came here and we toiled on your behalf because we loved you. That's essentially what he's saying. We love you because God loves you. And we cared for you because God cares for you. And I am nothing special in myself. I'm just a bread distributor. I'm a bread distributor handing out the bread of life that's been broken off and handed to me. And that's what you are too. We're bread distributors. The bread of life was given to us by Christ. He's the one that blessed it and said, take this out to the multitudes. Break it off, pass it on, break it off, pass it on, break it off, pass it on. That's what we are. And finally, in verses 11 and 12, Paul brings another family example, and he says, for you know that we dealt with each other, or sorry, we know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his children encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. Not everybody has a positive example of a father like that. So I, I would say that what Paul is saying is that this is a good example of a father, how a father is supposed to act as far as God's calling upon him, just as the mother is to be nurturing, the father is to be encouraging, comforting, and um, I guess... Uh, motivating to his children. So the apostle approaches the church stating that he came to them with this fatherly uh, heart as well, encouraging them, comforting them, motivating them to live lives worthy of God. That's, that's what the gospel encourages us to do. Live your life in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. Why? Why? Because you're not under law, but you're under grace. <laughs> so live it. Live as though you've been set free, because you have been. If you see yourself as, uh, as failing, failing, failing under the law, under the law, under the law, and I can't measure up, I can't measure up, can't measure up, guess what? That attitude sinks into you. If you look at yourself as a sinner that has been saved by grace through faith, in Jesus Christ, and that old things are passed away, that you're forgiven, that you are a child of the King of kings and Lord of lords, you love him. You love him and you want to serve him and you want to be holy even as he is holy because it brings you delight to be like your daddy. And that's what God's calling us to be. And that's what Paul's saying, I'm doing with you guys. This is the example for us to follow. How do we treat our brethren? How do we treat younger believers in Christ? That's the question. 
Paul encouraged um, the Thessalonians. Um, you see, because children need encouragement, don't they? They need encouragement. Endurance, tenacity, and such are not always the core uh, traits in our children. Generally, their endurance isn't very much. And they lose, they lose focus. They lose their, their attention isn't on things for very long. It's a core character trait of, of Christians that are young too. Paul encourages those who are mature in the faith to bring encouragement to those younger believers, to comfort them when you see that they're going through a hard time. Why do we come to church? There's two reasons. And one of them is not so that we can get blessed. If you come here this morning saying, I came here just to get blessed, you've come here for the wrong reason. We don't come here to get blessed. We come here to bless the Lord because He is worthy. And we come here to edify and to build up other people. That's why we come to church. And in the process, we will be blessed far beyond our ability to contain it because God is just like that. You can't outgive the Lord. When you come to Him with the right heart, He floods you with blessings that you can't even contain. Sometimes he gives you things that you never imagined that he would give you as a blessing. Why? Because he loves you. You don't come with that expectation. It's like, you know, sometimes I've been in the past, you know, God's kind of like the Santa Claus in the sky, you know, like if I jank, yank his chain this way, he's going to present good gifts to me. No, 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 that's not it. God desires to give you good gifts because he's your father, not Santa Claus. Santa Claus is some fictional guy that just uh, you know, flies around in red pajamas and drops presents down chimneys to good little boys and good little girls who deserve it and drops coals into their socks maybe if they don't. That's not God. God's a loving, compassionate, encouraging, comforting father. And every child needs role, role models to follow, good role models. Our ultimate role model is our father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. But also God asks us to be imitators of him and to be also good role models to one another. A father can be a tremendous role model. Or when he sins, a great source of discouragement to a child. So it's very careful. It's a very careful walk that we must live in the church. We must live in such a way that we honor one another and that if we do make an error, that we are quick to repent and ask for forgiveness and make it right. But it, it should be our habit to build one another up and to do what's mutually beneficial for the church. Amen. And just as a father wants to be proud of his children, so the Lord wants us to grow and to learn what it is to be like him. And that brings him glory. And that's why he calls us constantly to a life of holiness and obedience. Amen. And I ask the worship team to come forward. Amen. We're going to close with that song again. Um, Jesus, strong and kind. Would you stand with us this morning? Let's pray before we uh, sing. Jesus, you see each heart here today, and God, the ones that are discouraged, the ones that are feeling beat up, God, I just pray that you would help them to see how much you love them, Lord, and God, help us as brothers and sisters to recognize when someone needs encouragement and strengthening and help us God to be gentle with one another and to pray for one another and God we we pray that our hearts would reflect your gentleness and your goodness and your kindness God to others around us and Lord we give you praise this morning because of who you are
Thank you for being such a good father. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for nurturing us like a mother nurtures her children and for just being who you are, Lord. And thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul that's given to us in Thessalonians. We pray that you would help each person here today to go and have a blessed day and that your grace and peace would be multiplied to them.